Today I want to take some time and think with you about the New Covenant. The writer of Hebrews uh, builds much of his argument around the New Covenant as we get into chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. So it's very important that we understand what this covenant is and then how the writer uses it in his argument. The phrase, the New Covenant, really only occurs in Jeremiah 31, 31. However, it has become a label for many Old Testament texts that talk about uh, God's future age of salvation, that age in which God raises the real personal existence of human beings, his people, to a, a level of righteousness and then dwells among them. Now, uh, those passages that uh, we would typically think about as New Age passages in the Old Testament are in a footnote on the transcript to this lecture that you can find in the module if you're interested, so you can go and see what some of those other passages are. New Testament texts contain many promises. Uh, for example, they promise forgiveness, righteousness, a new social order, prosperity, and an endless life. But at the core of everything the New, Test the new Covenant promises, there are two things that are, are critical and central. And they are, first of all, God's promise to define the heart according to his word and so, so that the exhortation and instruction are no longer necessary. And the idea here is that the heart is the real person. And God promises that he will so drastically alter human existence uh, by, the, by his word and define it by his word that, that we are uh, transformed. And then the second promise is that God will dwell with his people forever. <clears throat> Now, these ideas are not new, the idea of, of transformation and uh, God dwelling with his people. As a matter of fact, if you look at Leviticus 26 verses, and verse 3, you'll read this. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. God would dwell among his people as long as they obeyed his law. And that was the problem with the Old Covenant. And it is where the Old Covenant is very different from the New Covenant. God also promised in the Old Covenant, or talked about, it commanded in the Old Testament, the need, the Old Covenant, the need for transformation and sanctification. As a matter of fact, the Old Covenant was a call to the sanctification of the people of God. If the nation followed the law, they would experience righteousness. Psalm 119 verse 40 talks about the correlation between uh, the law of God and the righteousness of the individual. At times, the Spirit of God applied some part of the law to a person's life or heart, and they experienced a spiritual transformation. But it was only in that area of their life. Israel's history is filled with inspiring stories of transformation as God used his word, his law, to bring about change in a person's life. I love Psalm 73. There the psalmist is wrestling with the injustices and equities that he sees in life. He's becoming very discouraged and, and thinking that everything that he has done to, to maintain his own walk with God and his own uh, standing before the Lord was a waste of time. And then it says this, and then I entered into the sanctuary of the Lord and I understood. Now what was central in the sanctuary of the Lord? What was the Ark of the Covenant? The, the ark, the box, which bore the law of God. And so the, the psalmist is saying, when I came in, reflected upon the law of God, then I understood what was really going on. <clears throat> uh, there are also times in which there's great national transformation that occurs as a result of the law of God. One of the great pictures is in Nehemiah 7, 4-9, where ne uh, Ezra gathers the whole uh, returned group of uh, Israelites uh, in into a holy convocation and reads and teaches the law of God to them. And, and the Spirit of God breaks their hearts and they begin to weep and they recognize that all of this suffering that they had experienced during the exile was the result of their sin. However, these manifestations of transformation were not universal or total. In the Old Testament narrative, uh, there are many high points, but there are also many more low points. <clears throat> the history of Israel demonstrates the law could not bring about the total and universal transformation of the people of God. 
The law commanded transformation, and it provided a picture about uh, what that transformation would look like, but it did not give promise of the grace and power necessary for sinful people to achieve that transformation. As I said, at times, the Spirit of God sovereignly moved in people's lives, and, and there was transformation, but this was not the result of promise. This was simply a sovereign work of the Spirit of God among his people. Now, so the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant had very similar objectives or very similar goals, but the means of achieving them was radically different. In many ways, the New Covenant mirrors the Old Covenant. I want you to notice this when we look at Old Covenant commands compared to New Covenant promises. All right, I want us to think a little bit about uh, what specifically the Old Covenant commanded and then how this uh, compares with what the New Covenant promised. In the Old Covenant, we read things like this. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked, Deuteronomy 10, 16. So the command is, you Israelites, circumcise your hearts. In Ezekiel 18 and 31, this is the command. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So the Israelites are told, you must get a new heart and you must get a new spirit. In Proverbs 7, 2 to 3, we read this. Keep my commandments and you will live. Guard my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So here God commands, write my law on your heart. You must do this. These are all in the, uh, in the uh, mood of command and they are all the responsibility of the Israelites. Now, no one in Israel ever kept this series of commands completely. Attempts were made, but their full realization eluded even the best of people. As the writer of Proverbs confessed, who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Proverbs 20 and verse 9. So, for this reason, because of the utter failure of the nation to, to do these things which were essential to their life as the people of God, the Lord gives a new set of promises in the New Covenant. And it is amazing how they correspond to what we have just read in the voice of command. First of all, the Lord says this in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 26, which is one of the first harbingers of the New Covenant. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. So here now God promises I will circumcise your heart. The Old Covenant, you must do it. But in this, this prof prophetic statement about the future, in one of the earliest statements of New Covenant promise, God says, I will do it. Ezekiel 20 or 36 and verse 26, this is what God says. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then this, and this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it to their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 31, 33, sorry, Jeremiah 31, 33. In each of these places, God promises to do in the new covenant what he commanded the Israelites to do in the old covenant. The old covenant was a call to obedience. The new covenant is a promise to secure obedience by an act of God. Now, I hope you understood that. The new covenant is a promise to secure obedience by an act of God, not human will. This is how McLean describes it. He says the benefits of the Mosaic Covenant will be attained and at the same time, its moral requirements will be secured, not as a legal condition of blessing, but as a divinely caused result. And the issue will be a manner of life. God will cause this to happen. Kyle gives a great summary of this uh, difference when he says this. 
It thus appears that the difference between the Old and the New Covenant must be reduced to this. What was commanded and applied to the heart in the Old is given in the New. When Jeremiah said that God would write his law to the heart, he anticipated the realization of everything that was commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And no one ever did that, but the new covenant promises to accomplish that by the power of God. That is an existence totally defined and controlled by God's word. Now, I, I, I think that it's worth quoting Eichrode at this point. He summarizes it quite well when he says, the strong emphasis which we find in Hosea and Jeremiah on the knowledge of God does not, according to generally agreed opinion, equate this word of Yahweh with intellectual contemplation or theoretical knowledge of the divine will. So when he says, I'm going to transform you by the knowledge of God, by the word of God, he's not just talking about cerebral activity. Rather, he says, but with an act whereby man admits the nature and will of God as these have been revealed in his inmost spiritual part, with the result that self now seems permeated and conditioned by the essential character of God. That's the new covenant promise. The new covenant promised more than an increase in knowledge, more than the forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of the Spirit, and, the, and an irrevocable salvation. It promised the total transformation of one's real personal existence, whereby that existence was permeated and conditioned by the essential character of God. Again, Icro summarizes it this way. The law written on the heart gives concrete reality to the full unity of will between God and man and renders superfluous any further instruction or exhortation from without. The new heart and the new spirit, uh, by which by the indwelling of God's spirit take the divine life wholly into themselves, make the keeping of the divine commandment the natural outcome of the inner communion with God, which thinks and acts from God's angle. So, we are now thinking and doing the will of God as a result of God's uh, work in our lives. So you see, what the New Testament, what the Old Covenant commanded, the New Testament promises will be realized and fulfilled by the power of God. Now this is very hard for people who have a very low view of God and believe that, that salvation is actually a divine human cooperative. It is not. I want us to take a few moments and think about uh, the writer of Hebrews' use of the New Covenant teaching. Uh, the writer connects Christ's Melchizedekian high priesthood with the New Covenant. Uh, beginning in chapter 7, he begins to unpack the relationship between the two. But the bottom line is that as a result of Christ's endless life and his inauguration of the New Covenant, Jesus is able to do what it says in 7.25. It says he is able to completely save those who come to God through him because he ever lives to intercede for them. The new covenant permeates this affirmation. People cannot save themselves. They cannot live up to God's moral expectations. Uh, salvation is not a matter of uh, being introduced to the way of salvation and then finding your way along the road. Uh, Jesus doesn't get us started on that road. It says that he completely saves. To make this point and explain the relationship between Christ and the new covenant, the, the, the writer begins with our need. And, and that need is perfection. In chapter 7 and verses 11 and 12, it says that the Levitical priesthood could not lead the people into perfection. Now, those priests, those Levitical priests had only one job, and that was to administer the law. So what we see here is a statement that they, they couldn't lead the people of God into perfection because the law uh, was not able to lead them into perfection. Uh, let's read Hebrews 7, 11, and 12. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come, one after the order of Melchizedek? Not in the order of Aaron. 
For when there is a change of the priesthood, there is also a change of the law. Now, what you see there very clearly is that the moment uh, the writer of Hebrews declares that Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he has immediately released Jesus from the law. Jesus' job is not to administer the law, but rather to administer the new covenant. The change from Aaron to Melchizedek singles a change in the law being administered. But, but why was there a need to change the law? The writer identifies that in chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. There it says this, The former regulation, which is the law, is set aside because it was weak and useless. And then he, says, he tells us what that weakness was. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. That phrase, the law made nothing perfect, is an important concept to remember whenever we think about moral regulation. It is one thing to stipulate requirements, one thing to lay out moral principles and moral uh, requirements, but the requirement itself, the regulation itself, the principle itself does not have the power to perfect. Only Jesus and the grace of God can do that. Now, finally, the, in, in these early statements, the writer points out that the Melchizedekian high priesthood of Christ is based on better promises. These promises address the weakness of the first covenant, and that weakness is its dependence upon, upon human beings. God did not find fault with the old covenant. He found fault in the people who were unable, because of sin, to do what it required. But the better promise of the new covenant Remove that barrier. God would, would now do for the people what they could not do for themselves. So, in, uh, in Hebrews we read this. But the ministry of Jesus... Re, sorry, i start that again. But the ministry Jesus received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been found sought after for another. But God found fault with the people. And he said this. And then he goes on and he quotes from the, the Jeremiah passage of the new covenant. Uh, the point the writer is making uh, is uh, that there was a need for a new covenant because of the weakness of the people. Uh, based on the quotes from Jeremiah 31, and then he draws a conclusion. He says this at the, in uh, chapter 8 and verse 13. By calling this covenant new, when Jeremiah called this a new covenant, he made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete is aging and will soon disappear. So there are two parts to this statement. What the writer is saying is that, that when uh, Jeremiah said God is giving a new covenant, he immediately, with that declaration, uh, antiquated the old covenant. But the second half of that, so, so in the first half looks at things from the standpoint of Jeremiah. The second half of the statement looks at it from the standpoint or the time frame of the Hebrews. Now, Cockerell doesn't agree with this. Cockerell says that everything that is said in verse 13 is from the standpoint of Jeremiah. Uh, this, is, this is what he says. He branded it as old, out of date, and thus inferior to the new. Furthermore, that which is becoming obsolete and growing old is on the, very, er, uh, is on the verge of passing away. The pastor is speaking from Jeremiah's point of view. As soon as God promised the new covenant, the old was near to passing away. Since the new has come in Christ, the old is no longer near to, but has definitively passed away, uh, as a way of relating to God. This assertion is a fitting transition to the imp impotence of the old uh, and tent and priestly service as it is described in 9, 1 to 10. The old covenant continues only as a type of the new. It is always intended to have this typological function. So, so Cockrell is saying that the minute Christ appeared, this idea of it is passing away was done. It was finished. It was only passing away from the standpoint of Jeremiah. Now, I don't think Cockrell is right here. I think that uh, this was the perfect opportunity for the writer to be very clear. If he thought that the Old Testament was done the moment Christ came, he would have just said 
that he rendered it powerless. But instead, he says, when Jeremiah said new, he makes the old one obsolete. And that which is obsolete from our standpoint right now is, is old and is passing, but it hasn't passed. He could have used language which would have made it very clear, it is finished, it is over, it is no longer relevant. But of course, that wouldn't have fit with New Testament teaching anyhow, because the law is never viewed that way, as something that is just taken out of the way. Jesus himself said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, John 5, 18. So, so the law is never just removed. It's, it's fulfilled, quite frankly, yes, but not removed. So I think when we're looking at things here in the book of Hebrews, we have to understand that the law from the writer of Hebrews perspective is passing. It is in a transitional place. And I don't know that we can completely explain that. Some of that might be eschatological. Uh, those who believe that Israel has a future, it makes a ton of sense. It fits right within their eschatological frame of reference that this national theocratic constitution that we call the law would have a future. It hasn't been totally taken out of the way, um, but that it has some future because Israel has some future. Now, uh, so the old covenant is passing, but not gone. This was the perfect opportunity for the author to declare the Old Testament is null and void, but he doesn't do that. Uh, some commentators argue that the reason he doesn't do that is because uh, he wouldn't view the law as gone until the temple had fallen, and that wouldn't happen until 70 AD when Titus would invade Jerusalem. However, for our writer, the emphasis is never upon the Herodian temple. That never figures in his discussions. He talks about the Solomonic temple. He talks more uh, often about the tabernacle and the service that surrounded the tabernacle. So I don't, I don't know that the fall of the Herodian temple would have been a big factor in understanding what he's saying here. Uh, besides that, uh, the temple had fallen many times, uh, but the law had not passed. There was no temple for... Uh, all of the time of the captivity. It had been raised to the ground. And then, of course, um, it was rebuilt under Haggai and uh, Zerubbabel. But, but, uh, and that temple was then absorbed into the greater Herodian temple. But, uh, so what I'm saying is that there were times when there was no temple, but the law it was not taken out of the way. So I don't think that, that, that he's referring to the fact that he's saying it's only passing because uh, the temple is still standing. I think rather what he's saying is that the Old Covenant would continue to have some validity until the time of the new order. Now, this causes some people problems because they have a misunderstanding of the Old Covenant. They see it as a means of salvation that rivals the salvation in Christ. But the Old Covenant was never given as a means of salvation. The Old Covenant was given to a redeemed people, brought out of Egypt by the redemptive power of God through the sacrifice of the Lamb, the Paschal Lamb, and brought to Sinai and given the law as a means of sanctifying the people of God. And, and even more than that, as a theocratic national constitution for the nation of Israel. So it was never to be viewed as a means of salvation. That is a, a Jewish heresy. Uh, that is something that Paul confronts in the, in the, in the book of Romans and Galatians and 1 Corinthians and Philippians, the law as a means of righteousness. And it is not what was taught in the law, but what was rather taught by um, errant Jewish tradition. And so we need to understand that. Rather, <clears throat> uh, though, it, though it's difficult to explain this first, that the law is passing, um, it does leave the door open for a continuing validity of the law. At least this helps one understand, as I said, these Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel. Now, now why would I say that? Well, in cha chapter 9 and verse 10, it says that the external regulations apply until the time of the new order. Now, some might ar argue that the new order came about the moment Christ died and inaugurated the new covenant, but that's not true. If anything, and uh, what we know is that there's an already not yet to this covenant. Jesus 
did everything necessary to inaugurate and make it possible for the promise of the new covenant to be fulfilled, but he has not totally brought about the realization of those promises. We are not yet glorified. You can't say, you wouldn't be in this class if you had the new covenant because you would not need a teacher. You would not need to exhort one another. And even in this letter, constantly the issue of, of Christians exhorting one another is so critical to their survival and difficulty. Well, if the new covenant were totally realized, that would not be necessary. So the new covenant has been inaugurated. We are receiving many of its benefits. We are experiencing some of the transformations, God writing to the heart things uh, that are transforming us, but we will not totally experience all of it until we're glorified. That is when it is totally enacted. And so the external regulations apply until the time of the new order. There'll be no need for the law once glorification has occurred. Okay, so, so um, when we think about this new covenant then, our writer sees it as critical because it speaks to our need. Our need is perfection. We cannot have access to God without perfection. And Christ, by applying the benefits of the new covenant to our lives, has fitted us for that perfection. But the already not yet dimension is there. Now, we find this in Paul's teaching as well. If you go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, Paul says that he is a minister of the new covenant. And he saw evidence of that. He said the Corinthians were a letter written by God, written on their hearts, known and read by all men. Um, and so he had this visualization of new covenant ministry whereby the Spirit of God wrote God's word to the heart, defined the person and changed the person. Though we are ministers of the new covenant, though we have this amazing access to God, though things are very different for us than they were for Old Testament saints, we haven't totally realized that covenant. You see, we have the promise. Old Testament saints had the promise of Abraham. They had justification by faith. But everything in their system of worship created nothing but a picture of barriers. And we'll talk about this in chapters 9 and 10. Uh, you know, everything. There was a wall around the temple and, and only some people could come into the courtyard and only some people could go into the holy place and only one person could go into the holiest of holies. And everything about that arrangement was barrier after barrier after barrier to the place where God manifest his glory. And, and the writer says, because the new covenant has been, ex has been inaugurated, all of the barriers are gone and we have access to God. Therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and find the mercy we need in our time of need. And so there is a huge difference for us over the Old Testament saint because of the accomplishments of Christ. But in some ways, we're like them because we are still struggling against sin. We have to yield to the Spirit. We have to experience the power by faith uh, to have this transformation take place in our lives.